In the 1920s, Bessie Smith was the blues singer. Although her recording career only lasted 10 years, she created a body of work that helped shape the sound of the 20th century. Her title, The Empress, was rightly hers and hers alone. Not only was she the big powerful voice of the era, but her very style was also the distillation of those other blues singers struggling to make themselves heard in a man's world. In many respects, it was also a dazzling tribute to the woman who had influenced Bessie the most, Ma Rainey. With Bessie Smith's arrival, there came the idea of a black woman's life as a drama, a lopsided morality play with a mythic cycle of birth, life, death, and rebirth. Through her records, her road tours, her imitatable high diva stage style, and her hotly discussed lifestyle, Bessie Smith became the most famous and highest paid black woman of her time, marking the end of one tradition, the diva enclosed solely in a black community, and the beginning of another, the diva coming above ground, openly affecting the dominant culture. Bessie Smith was born dirt poor in Chattanooga, Tennessee around 1894. Some sources mark her birth on April 15th. She was never anxious to give out her birth date. Abject poverty hardly describes the economic status of the family into which Bessie was born. William Smith and his wife Laura had met each other while working in Alabama at the Owen Plantation. When Bessie was born, they lived on Charles Street at the foot of Cameron Hill in an area of Chattanooga known as Blue Goose Hollow. A laborer and part-time Baptist preacher, William Smith ran a small mission near the one-room wooden shack that was their home. Bessie remembered it as a little ramshackle cabin that would have been tight quarters for two adults, let alone a family of eight. Actually, the size of the Smith family fluctuated for when there is little food and no medical attention, death becomes a frequent visitor. A seventh child known only as son died before Bessie was born. She lost her father while still an infant, and by the time she was nine, her mother had also passed, leaving her sister Viola as the caretaker. Bessie had a wretched childhood and never received an education. She took to singing in the streets to earn pennies. By 1912, she had left Tennessee and was performing in a troupe with Pa and Ma Rainey. A year later, she was singing at the 81 Club in Atlanta. She married a young man named Earl Love, who died not long after their union. Through the teens of the century, Bessie spent long, lean, tough years performing on the Black Vaudeville circuit. She worked anywhere, in tents, carnivals, honky-tonks, performing in her street clothes, often dancing as much as she sang. By the early 1920s, she settled in Philadelphia and married Jack Gee, a night watchman. Although his application was turned down by the police department, he often flashed a photo of himself in a police uniform. By the time of her marriage to Gee, Bessie's reputation was established, but her great fame came with her recordings. Incredibly enough, three different record companies rejected her. They thought she sounded too raw, too loud, too unsophisticated, and no doubt, downright too colored. Frank Walker, the man Columbia Records put in charge of his race records division, recordings done by black artists, was said to be the only white man Bessie trusted. Walker heard Bessie singing in a low down dive in Selma, Alabama as early as 1917. She was just a little kid of 17 or 18, he said. I never heard anything like the torture and torment she put into the music of her people. It was the blues and she meant it. She made such an impression on him, the story goes, that he, in 1923, sent Clarence Williams, his race records judge, to bring her up from the South to New York City. The audition went well, and Bessie signed a contract. Columbia promised Bessie $1,500 in exchange for 12 recorded songs. Although white performers at the time had better contracts, Bessie felt it was a good deal. Her first record was Downhearted Blues, written by Lovey Austin and Alberta Hunter. It sold a million copies in the first year, surpassing the sales of all female blues singers at the time. As a recording artist at Columbia, Bessie recorded songs with some of the most famous musicians of the era, including Louis Armstrong. She made over 160 recordings for Columbia Records. 
Records broadened her audience. She continued to tour, eventually starred in her own show, and played in some of the largest cities such as Nashville, Memphis, Detroit, Chicago, Philadelphia, New York, Cleveland, Atlanta, Birmingham, Cincinnati, and Indianapolis. Soon her reputation preceded her, and for many in the tiny rural towns or the big cities, seeing Bessie Smith was a once-in-a-lifetime experience. Bessie's stage persona was similar to Ma Rainey's, the emotional, well-traveled woman returning to relate her troubles and triumphs. Nothing was ordinary about Bessie Smith, not even the way she looked, for she was a large woman, big-boned, broad-built, and very dark. She stormed stages circling and courting her audience, dressed in outrageous get-ups, short-haired wigs, sequenced gowns, furs, and jewels in eccentric hats. Her style was in the keeping with the inhibited, far-out air of the time, making her the personification of the big-hearted, good-time gal out for lots of fun. Her emblem was her huge, joyous smile, which, as a great artist, she knew when to turn on and turn off. In no time, the sensual, hepped-up partying sister could give way to the reflective, pragmatic, soulful woman recording the woes of the world. Bessie sang about the things her audiences were living and feeling, and as a result, they identified with her deeply. Bessie's material was varied. She sang of love and heartache, coming on as a woman who understood men, their good points and their bad. Characters in her songs needed men to complete the stories in their lives, yet in Bessie's hands, having a man seemed her divine right. Bessie sang of men in general, using them as a backdrop for a story of weariness and pain. At the same time, her attitudes toward men were similar to those that men expressed toward women. In Do Your Duty, she said that if she called her man three times a day to come drive her blues away, then he should naturally come prepared to play, to do his duty. Bessie demanded from the man all the service that he could supply, and in an era when the conventional flapper sought her independence, Bessie already had hers. In her music, she never feared the thing that women were always cautioned to never be self-assertive. It was precisely her self-assertion and her non-traditional role as a woman that drew female followers to her. In her body songs, Need a Little Sugar in My Bowl, I'm Wild About That Thing and You Gotta Give Me Some, Bessie represented the sensual woman stepping forward, expressing her needs, appetites, and fantasies. Other Bessie Smith songs struck different moods and Taint Nobody's Business If I Do, a song that was a favorite for other divas as well. She announced that if she had the notion to jump in the ocean, then it wasn't nobody's business if she did, adding that if her friend didn't have any money and if she were to say take all of hers, honey, then again, it wasn't nobody's business if she did. Bessie approached this song as if it was an anthem proclaiming women's independence, her right to her own follies and idiosyncrasies. Nobody knows when you're down and out tells the story of a woman who once lived high and now has fallen low without money or a friend to help. And it sounds as if it came straight out of the hard luck 1930s. Give me a pig foot and a bottle of beer remains one of her best pieces capturing the energy of Harlem rent parties, speakeasies, and bootleg gin. Offstage, Bessie was a fascinating figure as well. In this period when the black press was still evolving, black newspapers such as the Philadelphia Tribune, the Chicago Defender, as well as the powerful black grapevine had a field's day with Bessie's offstage antics. Bessie's biographer, Chris Albinson, pointed out that in the 1920s, black audiences came to theaters anticipating the legend as much as the entertainer. Everyone has some Bessie story to tell. According to Albinson, there were tales of her flights of fancy when she might desert her traveling troupe and rush off to another town for some fun and loving. Then there were the stories of her spending sprees. And one summer alone, she and husband Jack Gee were said to have spent $16,000 and she was known to have paid cash for cars. Her drinking binges were famous. She would enter a local tavern, tell the bartender to lock the door not to let anyone in or out, then lay $100 on a counter, after which there were unlimited drinks for everyone. They all partied, sometimes for days. Her temper was legendary too. She hit anyone who annoyed her or messed with her, man or woman. 
When she thought her husband was fooling around with some other woman, she would haul off and slap him. On one occasion, she even chased him down a railroad track while firing a pistol at him. Her lovers, male and female, were talked about. At one time, when a young woman buckled and withdrew after being publicly kissed by Bessie, the girl was given such a dressing down by Bessie that thereafter, she was kissed when and where the Empress wanted without a word of complaint. Bessie was also extravagant. She traveled with her own entourage and her own private railroad car, which would be detached at a local depot. After which Bessie's workers would set up tents, then roam the streets passing out flyers that said the Empress is here in town for a performance. Bessie was no woman to tangle with. She was tough on any entertainer that she thought might be a possible threat. During Ethel Waters' early days as a struggling young performer, she appeared on the same bill with Bessie in Atlanta. The Empress laid down a law that Waters, whom she called Long Goody, could not sing any blues. When the audience cried out for Waters to sing some blue songs, she broke Bessie's rule. Backstage, loud Bessie let it be known what she thought. And later, as Waters wrote in her autobiography, the Empress really spoke her mind. Come here, Long Goody, Waters quoted Bessie saying, you ain't so bad. It's only that I never dreamed that anybody would do this to me in my own territory, with my own people, and you know you can't sing. Throughout the 1920s, Bessie's records and personal appearances were tremendously successful. On rare occasions, she performed before white audiences. She also did radio shows. By the 30s, some white college students started to collect her records. Even actress Mae West picked up her hands-on-hips pose from Bessie. The high period of Bessie Smith's career came to an end by the late 1920s. Blues fell out of favor. A new star with a different kind of flash came into vogue. Bessie's engagements became few. Her money was running out. She was drinking steadily. Eventually, her husband took off with another entertainer, Gertrude Saunders. Then the depression nearly wiped her out. Record producer John Hammond ran across her working as a hostess in a North Philadelphia dive, singing pornographic songs for tips. In 1933, she made her last recordings for Hammond on Columbia's label. Three days later, a youngster named Billie Holiday made her first recordings for the same company. Bessie fought to regain her stardom and went so far as to modify her flamboyant style. She wore simple, elegant gowns without the wigs or wild hats. Her hair brushed back, revealing a striking middle-aged woman. Although she never made a big comeback, Bessie never stopped working in the 30s. In 1937, she set off on tour throughout the South with a new man by her side, Richard Morgan, Lionel Hampton's uncle. During the tour, Bessie's car driven by Morgan crashed into a truck, her right arm nearly severed, and she lay bleeding for hours on a lonely country road. Bessie Smith died at a hospital in Clarksville, Mississippi. A massive crowd turned out for her funeral. Far from diminishing her legend, her years of decline simply intensified it. After her death, the story spread that she bled to death when refused admittance to a nearby white hospital. Although the story has been discounted, it remains part of her legend. In 1961, Edward Albee used this legendary story of her death as a basis for his play, The Death of Bessie Smith, which was a denunciation of bigotry in America. Although thousands of fans mourned her death, her estate had few funds. Bessie was buried in an unmarked grave in a cemetery in Sharon Hill, Pennsylvania, as any money raised for a tombstone was pocketed by her ex-husband, Jack Gee. In 1970, singer Janis Joplin and NAACP leader Juanita Green Smith paid to have her tombstone erected. It reads, the greatest blues singer in the world will never stop singing. Bessie Smith was the last of a specific type, the dark diva firmly entrenched in a black community. The black beauties who followed from Josephine Baker to Ethel Waters to Billie Holiday started in a black community, but eventually met great success in a white world too. And perhaps what disoriented some of the later figures was that, unlike Bessie, they were torn from their roots and found they could never really go home again. 
Although Bessie took the diva into the mainstream culture, she was never really a part of it. Of her awards, honors, and acknowledgments, Bessie Smith appeared in a short motion picture, St. Louis Blues in 1929. Since 2006, it's been preserved in a National Film Registry of the U.S. Library of Congress. The film, based on the lyrics of the song which Bessie sings, is the only known footage of the singer and shows the emotional power of her performance. Three of Smith's recordings have been inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame, Downhearted Blues, St. Louis Blues, and Empty Bed Blues in 2006, 1993, and 1983, respectively. She was inducted into both the Blues Hall of Fame in 1980 in its inaugural class and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1989. Also in 1989, Smith was awarded a Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award, and in 1994, the U.S. Postal Service issued a commemorative Bessie Smith postage stamp. In 2001, Bessie's song, Downhearted Blues, was named one of the songs of the century by the National Endowment for the Arts. In 2002, it was placed on the National Recording Preservation Board by the Library of Congress. In 2015, HBO released the movie, Bessie, based on Bessie Smith's life, starring Queen Latifah. Bessie was the most watched HBO original film in the network's history. The film was well received critically and garnered four Primetime Emmy Awards winning Outstanding Television Movie. Bessie Smith was the blueprint for many of the great divas to follow, such as Billie Holiday, Mahalia Jackson, Big Mama Thornton, Dinah Washington, Sarah Vaughn, Aretha Franklin, Janis Joplin, and so many others. Her soulful voice and her artistic boldness shaped American music. She brought the blues from the underground to the main stage, solidifying the presence and power of the dark diva. A century later, she still reigns supreme. Bessie Smith, Empress of the Blues and Onyx Queen. If you enjoyed this video, please share, like, and subscribe to this channel. Thank you for watching.